Good morning, my name is Norman Patterson. I'm a Christian evangelist and abortion abolitionist. And I preach all throughout Connecticut. And today, I'm preaching a little message on 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which says, starting in verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save, to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both the Jews and the Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that many, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glories, let him glory in the Lord. What Paul's saying in that section is that to the world, the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ is foolishness because humanity believes that they are the most wise, that they have everything that they need except God. They don't even believe for the most part that there is a being that is God. And that's why when you preach the cross, it's foolishness to the world. The reason the cross is foolishness to the world is because in the eyes of the world, when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, that was the most weak, most foolish moment of all of history. I mean, the man, Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, in the eyes of the world, it looked like an utter failure. Because here's Jesus Christ being executed by Rome, the Roman Empire, by the civil magistrates, Pontius Pilate gave the Jews permission to crucify Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, it looked like it was absolute foolishness. I mean, some of you don't even believe that he existed. There's ample evidence that the person, Jesus Christ, lived and died over 2,000 years ago. But the reason the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing because they don't see the power of God that is in what appears to be the greatest failure of all human history. A, a, a man named Jesus being crucified by the Roman Empire with the stamp of approval of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders. But the reason it's foolish in the world's eyes is because the cross looks like it's just absolute powerlessness as far as the world is concerned. You see, the world glories in power. The, the world glories in, 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 in power. That's why we have grand buildings like this, because it's a testimony how human beings glory in power. We glory in the United States and our military complex. We glory in power. 
We glory in political power. We glory in the power that wealth and money and beauty bring. But in the eyes of God, that beauty means absolutely nothing. That beauty means that, that power of the world that human beings glory in, the glory of the intellect. I mean, our universities are, are sanctuaries that try to glory in the intellect of humankind. But ultimately speaking, the Bible teaches that the, the glory of man is foolishness in the eyes of God. How you doing, sir? Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. I'm Norman Patterson. It's foolishness in the eyes of God because God is all-powerful and all the glory that we have as human beings is going to pass. I mean, look at all the great empires of all history. The Assyrians, they're gone. The Babylonians, they're gone. The Persians, they're gone. The Roman Empire is gone. The greatness of the British Empire is, gro is gone. You see, we glory in government and we glory in might and power. And so it looks like to human beings, particularly those in power, that the cross of Jesus Christ is absolute foolishness. And they would call me a fool for coming out here on a call morning and preaching the life and death and crucifixion and resurrection and ascension and glorification eventually of Jesus Christ. It looks like foolishness to the world. And so people that get, go out preaching like me, we look like fools. But I would rather be a fool in the world's eyes than in God's eyes because the Bible says that only a fool says in his heart that there is no God. And if you walk around your life believing that there is no being, that no ultimate being in the center of this universe, the Bible calls you a fool. I mean, the, the obviousness of the reality of the one and only self-existing God who created heaven and earth is abundantly filled with proof. But ultimately speaking, the God of the Bible is the ultimate proof of proof itself. And so I'm here preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the foolishness of the cross. And the foolishness of cross is that when God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, came into this world, Jesus Christ, who was incarnate, God, who was fully God and fully man, came into this world. As far as the world is concerned, there was nothing great about him. I mean, he was born in a manger. He wasn't born in Caesar's palace. You see, the world would have been impressed if Jesus Christ was born with all kinds of pomp and circumstance, but Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, was born with no pomp and circumstance. He was born as a little tiny baby in a manger, absolutely weak and helpless. And in the eyes of the world, that's foolishness. You see, when, when something is born into the world, we want to celebrate, we want to, you know, um, have holidays around it. But Jesus Christ was born into this world, an innocent child, fully God and fully man, born in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, who was fully God and fully man, walked on the face of this earth, and he was different than the powers that be. I mean, Caesar during that time was Augustus, and the word Augustus means high and exalted one. And that's what we often believe when it comes to government. We believe that the government is high and exalted even over the reality and the knowledge of God Almighty. And so far too often the world ignores the wisdom of God and the wisdom of God is seen in the person and work of Jesus Christ. I mean, we hear about his birth and we hear a little bit when he was, a, I don't know, about eight years old when his parents forgot him and he was in the temple. And then we don't hear about Jesus Christ. God bless you. We don't hear about Jesus Christ until later on when he's around 30 years old. And so there he lived in obscurity and he says that he was a carpenter, not doing some sort of great work. And that's how God is different than the world. Because here God comes into this world and he be, he's a carpenter, a man who makes things by the power of his own hands. And even when he came into this world, 
when he started this ministry, he was baptized. And there was not a huge fanfare, though there was the voice of God from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But the mission of Jesus Christ was to do the will of God the Father in absolute and total perfection. That's what Jesus Christ came to do. He even says that Jesus said, I have come to do the will of my Father. And ultimately speaking, when Jesus Christ did the will of his Father, he ended up upon the cross. He ended up upon the cross. And in the eyes of the world, it looked like the world had won. It looked like Satan had won. But the power of God was seen upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Son of Man on the cross. Because on the cross of Jesus Christ, that's where Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, bore the sins of all who would believe in and trust in Him. You see, the cross is a testimony of how wicked and sinful sin is. Because sin costs God his very best. That's why it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, God the Father so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. You see, God the Father manifested his love for us in that he sent Jesus, his only Son, who is the Son of God and the Son of Man, into this world. And when God sent Jesus Christ, he sent them with, with him with a specific mission. And the mission of Jesus Christ was to obey the law of God, was to reveal the Father, to exegete the Father, as it says in John chapter 1. Jesus Christ came to reveal to us who the Father is and what the Father is like. And so when it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that word gave in John 3, 16 is a very bloody word because when God the Father gave Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, he gave his very best. Could you imagine, I have two sons, could you imagine giving your son? Well, God the Father gave his son, Jesus, to die for the sins of the world. And so what happened upon the cross, what happened upon the cross is that we see the wrath of God being revealed towards sin. We don't hear many people talking about the wrath of God anymore, but that's what the cross of God was all about. It was about the wrath of God being visited upon, good morning, how are you doing? It was being visited upon Jesus Christ, put upon Jesus Christ. That's how awful sin is. People walk around like sin is a great time, that we're going to have a good time going and sinning, but sin costs God his very best. You see, on the cross, Jesus Christ was the Son of God and the Son of Man. And when Jesus was on the cross, he was on the cross as an innocent man, a representation of all mankind. Just like Adam was a representation. Hey, good morning, how you doing? Remind me of your name. What was that? Remind me of your name. Gianzanti, Officer Gianzanti. Yeah, we've met a couple of times. I'm Norman. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you again. I might ask you again because sometimes I forget names. Anytime, my friend. Anytime. God bless you. And so the cross of Jesus Christ is a manifestation. It shows us just how horrible sin is. You see, there's a lot of people that don't realize and don't understand and don't want to recognize just how and terrible sin is. And what is sin? Well, the Bible is very clear what sin is. The Bible defines sin in the book of 1 John as the breaking of, the transgression of, or any want or conformity to the law of God. You see, when human beings break the law of God, there's pain and there's suffering. There's tears. There's broken hearts and there's broken lives. You see, if we kept the law of God, we would not have the, the horror that we have in this world. We would not have holocausts. We would not have murder. We would not have people stealing. We wouldn't even have a need for a legislature because there would be peace and harmony. The very fact 
that we have a legislative office building and legislators testifies to the reality of how wicked and awful and sinful or terrible that sin is. You see, oftentimes we want to believe that sin is something, first of all, we, we want to believe that it's something that's fun. I mean, people think that it's fun to commit adultery. People think it's fun to cheat and to lie and to steal and to hate, to do whatever it is that they want, to covet. But you see, the whole notion of sin is the law of diminishing returns. And this is how Satan and his demons fool people. Because at first, sin seems like it's going to be something that's fun. And at first, when you engage in sin, it is fun. There's oftentimes a good time to be had when you're doing something that's sinful. But over time, you begin to realize the more you indulge in sin, in breaking God's law, over time you realize that it's not so much fun. You know, at first getting drunk, you know, the kids on college campuses and in high school, they sneak alcohol. At first it seems like a lot of fun until they're heaving in a toilet, throwing up their guts, or they find themselves addicted to alcohol. Sin at first is fun, but there's the law of diminishing returns. At first it's fun to take drugs, but over time you become a, a drug addict. Some people think it's fun to commit adultery or look at pornography, but that's not fun when children are being hurt, when women are being exploited, and when women are being raped by pornography. It's a horrible and terrible thing. And pornography is rampant in the United States of America. It's a deep underlying sin. I mean, children even are being trafficked by pedophiles. There's a whole market of child pornography. And if that's not something to bring you to your knees and cry out to God for mercy, I don't know what is. Innocent children being exploited by the lusts of men and women who will defy the law of God. Yes, yeah, sin seems fun at first, but over time, what we see as the result of sin are broken lives. Children being hurt, men being hurt, women being hurt. Sin does nothing but destroy society, and it does nothing but destroy our very souls. And the cross of Jesus Christ testifies to the horror and wickedness of sin. That sin must be something that must be punished. There must be justice meted out by God in the face of human sin. And there's another belief about sin, that sin is something that's private. You know, there's many people sin in the privacy of their own homes. Or people sin in the privacy, or people sin in the privacy of darkness, in the privacy of a closet, or whatever. But you see, sin is not something that is private, because when any human being sin sins, it always hurts other human beings. There is no such thing as private sin. And part of the reason for that is that we are people that are connected with other people. We are people that have other people that love us. And so when any of us indulge in sin, we end up hurting those that love us. We end up hurting our communities. We end up hurting our families. And how many people indulge in sin and hurt their families? And so the cross of Jesus Christ is a testimony of how wicked and awful and sinful and sin actually is. And the sin is foolishness in the eyes of the world. How is it that the cross of Jesus Christ can take away the sin of anyone who believes in God? How is it that Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, could die upon the cross... And how could that take away the sin of the world? 
And so it seems like it says in chapter 1 that the cross is foolishness. Foolishness to the world. How is it? Well, the only way it can take away the sin of the world is that God the Father has sent God the Son into this world to bear our sins. Every one of us has broken the law of God, but not Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the, the, the only begotten Son of God. He is the only one that has not violated, not broken the law of God. The life of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, is a life of pure obedience to the will of the Father. And so when Jesus Christ went to the cross, he, how you doing? God bless you. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he went as an innocent man. He did never, never did he break the law of God. And this is absolutely important to understand. So that when Christ went to the cross and the wrath of God towards sin was visited upon him, that means that Jesus Christ, how are you doing, sir? That means Jesus Christ only was qualified to take away the sin of the world, to forgive us of our sins as God the Father visited the punishment that sin deserves upon Jesus Christ, his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so what happened upon the cross of Jesus Christ is that God the Father punished God the Son, Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man. God the Father poured out the punishment that sin deserves upon Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son. And why did God do that? God did that because sin must be punished. Sin must be dealt with. And the way that God dealt with sin was by punishing the innocent Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God and the Son of Man on behalf of sinners. And so while we, like even this cross that I hold here, it's a beautiful wooden cross. It's all been sanded down, it's been stained, and it looks very beautiful. And it's like us as human beings that try to beautify the cross of Jesus Christ. But actually this, this is a symbol of, of Roman execution. Rome, Ro the Roman Empire perfected execution. They came up with a way to torture a human being with the most brutal form of execution known to man. They got the ideas of crucifixion from the Babylonians. And they, they perfected, actually a person who dies upon the cross died of asphyxiation. Not only did they die of asphyxiation, but they were absolutely in tremendous physical pain hanging upon the cross. And that's why the hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, the wondrous cross is a symbol of execution of the Roman Empire. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he physically, physically felt incredible, terrible, awful pain, and which is designed to do. But ultimately speaking, Jesus Christ was experiencing the physical pain that sin deserves. So that when Christ was upon the cross, he experienced actual physical pain as the punishment for sin. He was the innocent one, but he was experiencing the physical pain that sinners who trust in him deserve. But he also felt the burden of the weight of sin. That's why Christ said upon the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what that means is, is that God the Father poured out the punishment, his wrath that sin deserves upon God the Son, so that all who trust in him, 
All who put their faith in him will have their sins forgiven. That's why Paul says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish. But to those who trust in God, those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, God promises that he will forgive your sin based upon what Christ the Messiah did upon the cross. And that's for you, sir. If you put your hope and faith in the person and work of Jesus, that means that God, the Father, will count the punishment that he poured out upon God the Son upon the cross. He will count that in your place. That's what it means that Jesus Christ was a substitute for sinners. Because when Christ went to the cross, for all those who trust in Jesus Christ, he is their substitutionary atonement. He is the sacrifice that takes away the sin of all those who trust in him. You will be punished for your sin, or you will have Christ being punished for your sin. That's the choice that we make as human beings before God Almighty. Someday when you stand before God, you will either hear that Jesus Christ has died on behalf of your sin and been punished for your sin, or you will bear the burden and the punishment of your sin upon yourself. That's why Paul says that to the world, to the world, the cross is absolute foolishness. To the Jews, it is a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, it is foolishness because the Jews did not trust in the vicarious substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. And the Greeks, the Greeks prided themselves upon power and knowledge. The Jews prided themselves upon the light, the light that they believed that, that the Torah actually did give. But Jesus Christ, who was fully God and fully man, took upon himself the wrath of God that sin deserves. So that all who trust in and believe in Jesus, the Son of God and the Son of Man, God promises that he will grant you forgiveness based upon what Christ did upon the cross. That's right. And so all who trust in Jesus Christ, all who put their hope and their faith in Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God and the Son of Man, the promise of the Bible is that God the Father will forgive you on behalf of God the Son by the power of God the Holy Spirit, applying the blood of Jesus Christ to your dead and sinful God bless you. God bless you, sir. You believe that? Amen. Amen, brother. We are brothers in Christ. I appreciate the encouragement. I really do. So all who trust in Jesus Christ, all who put their faith in him, the promise of the word of God, the promise that we have in the Bible is that God himself, God the Father, will acquit us he will count us as not guilty. He will count the death of Jesus Christ or the life of Jesus Christ as fulfilling the law of God and the death of Jesus Christ as fulfilling the justice of God and the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And so there's a humility that we must have as Christians. You see, in order to come to God, you must humble yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so the humble ourselves means that we're not going to trust in ourselves anymore. We're not going to trust in our wealth. We're not going to glory in government. We're not going to glory in power and might and military, but we will glory in nothing else but the cross of Jesus Christ. And everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord will glory in the, in the cross of Jesus Christ. 
In the eyes of the world, it looks like the absolute failure of God, but the cross of Jesus Christ is the absolute victory of God over sin and death. Because biblical Christianity teaches that Jesus Christ, not, not only did he die upon the cross, not only was he buried for three days, but he rose again from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a testimony. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a testimony to the reality that Jesus Christ is who he says he is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Son of Man. The resurrection of Jesus Christ testifies to the truth of the Bible. There were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <sighs> There's no greater fact of history that has more substantiation then the resurrection, the actual, physical, literal, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why when we depict the cross, we depict an empty cross. And the reason Protestants depict an empty cross is because we believe wholeheartedly that God himself was risen from the dead. That's why we have an empty cross. You see, very soon, next week, it's Easter Sunday. Next week is Resurrection Sunday. And on Resurrection Sunday, Christians all over the world will celebrate the reality that Jesus, the Messiah, has been risen from the dead. The fact that Jesus has been risen from the dead is absolute and total proof What's that, sir? If you have something to say, come say it. I'll have an intelligent conversation with you. Oh, come on, don't be a coward. Come on and talk. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the absolute proof that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, that he is the Son of God and the Son of Man, fully God and fully man. The resurrection of Jesus Christ shows that Christ has completed all that God has sought out to accomplish upon the cross of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ testifies to the reality that Jesus Christ truly is the Son of God and the Son of Man. The resurrection of Jesus Christ testifies to the reality that Jesus Christ lives right now, that he ascended into heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. The resurrection of Jesus Christ shows that biblical Christianity is the one and only true faith and that all other faiths are counterfeits. And I'll tell you why. Because Muhammad is still in the grave. There's no resurrection in Islam. Joseph Smith is still in the grave. Buddha is still in the grave. Every religion cannot boast what biblical Christianity boasts. The biblical Christianity boasts that we believe in a risen Savior that is risen from the dead. And because he's risen from the dead, the truth of biblical Christianity cannot be refuted. And that every human being must face the reality that there is only one true God at the center of this universe. And this one true God calls us all to repentance, calls us all to bend our knee to him. But you see, human beings do not want to bend our knees to him. Human beings want to bend our knees to ourselves. And that's why the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that are perishing, because ultimately speaking, humanism worships mankind, humankind itself. We make ourselves our own God. We do not want to believe that there is a God, a self-existing holy God that exists in and of himself. No, biblical Christianity is founded upon the reality that Jesus Christ has been risen from the dead. 
And it's not just a symbolic resurrection. <coughs> Pardon me. When Jesus Christ was risen from the dead, it was a literal, excuse me, physical, bodily resurrection. Jesus was in the tomb for three days and three nights, and on Resurrection Sunday, East, what we call Easter Sunday, Christ was risen again from the dead. And because he was risen again from the dead, all who trust in him will experience the actual physical resurrection from, of their physical bodies from the dead. But even before that, when we die, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we will live for all eternity. We will have brand new life right at the moment of death for all who trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says, first comes death and then the judgment. You see, what's going to happen to you, sir, and to me and to every human being is that we are going to die. We have expiration dates on our bodies, on our hearts, on our lungs. And the Bible says, when we die, we will stand before God Almighty. And if you are clothed in, trusting in, believing in the holiness, the righteousness, the blood of Jesus Christ, you will have forgiveness of your sins. But if you're not, you will go to hell. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. If you do not put your faith and hope in Jesus Christ, you will be separated from God from all eternity. For all eternity. You see, hell is a real place. Hell is a real place. And there are people in hell right now in suffering and torment and anguish and their chance to change, their chance to come to repentance is gone. The only time that we can turn to Jesus Christ is right now in this life. And if you do not take that time, if you do not take that opportunity, if you do not heed to the command to trust in God, to trust in Jesus Christ, I tell you, you will die in your trespasses, in your sins. You see, we as human beings, we're born into this world. We're born into this world physically alive, but we're spiritually dead. And that's why the Bible says, you being dead in your sins and your trespasses. How you doing? God bless you too. You see, human beings are born into this world. We're born spiritually dead, but physically alive. And unless we are born again of the Spirit, unless we are born again, that's the terminology that the Bible uses. The Bible says, you must be born again. That's true of every human being. The reason we must be born again is because in our spirits, we're born into this world spiritually dead. We're dead towards God. The book of Ezekiel chapter 36 says that we have hearts of stone. And unless God takes away our hearts of stone and gives us a heart of flesh, that is a heart that can respond to God, we will die in our trespasses and in our sins. And so I come here today, I come here today proclaiming the good news, the euangelion, which means good word, good message to you today, that if you put your hope and your trust in Jesus, if you trust in him alone, I tell you what seems foolishness in the eyes of the world, that will be your very salvation. The cross of Jesus Christ, the cross on which the Prince of Glory died, will be the very means by which you will live for all eternity, by the power of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray that anybody that has heard this today at this legislative office building here in Hartford, Anybody that hears me later and listening to this message, God commands you to turn away from your sin. God commands you to repent of your sin. God commands you to trust in and believe in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. 
And if you do that this day, the word of God, God will always keep his word because God is true to himself. I tell you, you will find that God has his arms open to you because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Come to Christ this day and live. And if you do come to Christ this day, what happens is that God, the Holy Spirit, will apply the blood of Jesus Christ to your dead and sinful heart. He will apply the power and the life of Jesus Christ. He will apply the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's why the Bible says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, all we need to do is, by the power of the Holy Spirit, come to God and to confess our sin, that we are sinners, and we sin because we have sinful hearts, and we come to God in humility like that and confess our sins before Him. The Bible says God is faithful. God is true. That's what that word means. God is true to Himself, and He will forgive us of our sins and then he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness that's what the glory of god is all about and that's what he's going to do for us all of us who put our hope and our faith and our trust in god almighty and i'm going to continue as they get out And the message of salvation, salvation is open to all, open to all who will humble themselves and put their faith, put their hope, put their trust in Jesus, the Messiah, who is the Son of God and the Son of Man. I tell you, today you can have all your sin forgiven by God Almighty. All your sin can be washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. That's the beautiful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God can and will forgive you. Wash away all your sin. Take away all your guilt. Take away all your shame. All those things that you carry, all the burdens of your soul, all the sins that you carry in the burden of your own heart. I tell you, you can come to God this day through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. What's that, ma'am? Amen, sister. God bless you. And if you put your trust and hope in Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man, I tell you, God will forgive you on behalf of what He has done for us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I am the way, not a way. Jesus said, I am comes to the Father, but by me. There's no other way to be made right with God than through Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and the Son of Man, who is fully God and fully man. There's no way to be made right with God but by Jesus Christ. He is the only way. And that's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way is through the way of the cross. The way is through the blood of Jesus Christ. The way is through the Son of God, Jesus the Messiah, who laid down his life on behalf of sinners so that all who trust in him, you believe that, ma'am? You do? God bless you. All who trust in Jesus Christ, I tell you, God will forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's the power and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to close now. I'm going to go someplace else and preach. And I pray that God was glorified and that he will take the foolishness of my preaching and the fool that I am for Christ and use it for his honor and glory.
To God alone be the glory. Amen. You see, there's no other way. That's why Jesus Christ said, I am the way. Jesus didn't say, I am a way. Jesus Christ used a definitive article which says, I am the way. I am the truth. You see, truth is not just some sort of arbitrary philosophical concept. Biblical Christianity teaches that Jesus Christ is the truth. Jesus himself said, I am the truth. And there's no other way to get right with God than through the person and work, through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the sacrifice of Christ over 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ makes the audacious claim that he is the only way to be made right with God. There is no other way to be made right with God than through the person and work of Jesus Christ.